Over to you, Paul. Hi, I'm just going to say thanks very much, Ian, for that glowing uh, introduction. It's a little bit intimidating having to play um, after, <laughs> after that. Um, but I am going to go very um, briskly through the history of Scottish fiddle music, which really, if you, if you were going to do this in any, any great depth, you, you would need to do a series of events, probably lasting about 10 hour programmes, I would say, and you would still be missing quite a lot. So to do this in 45 minutes is a bit of a tall order, but I'm going to try my best. Um, um, ideally, I suppose the music does the speaking for itself and, and I can just maybe um, fill in some blank spaces and enlighten you a few facts along the way. But really, the music says more than I can ever tell you. Um, the, the fiddle in Scotland goes back to far, far beyond um, the period when the violin arrived in Scotland. And generally, it's considered about the time of the restoration of King um, Charles II. So um, the mid 1600s is when the violin becomes what it is known as today. There's been very few modifications. The main one being the neck of the violin has, has, has lengthened slightly. Um, that's one way you could tell um, a fiddle of a certain vintage of an especially short neck. But a lot of these very old fiddles, you found that um, the neck was changed and lengthened and regrafted onto the fiddle. So um, anyway, that's a different subject. But so we're back to the violin being here in about the 1650s. Before that was more ancient instruments, which pretty much died out in Scotland within a generation. And we're talking about things like fetals, um, viols, rebecks, um, common instruments that were played traditional folk music in the country. And um, there's one notable um, account of um, when Mary Queen of Scots arrived in Edinburgh to take up the crown that... Um, there was a French courtier was was with her, and he um, wrote that there was a huge crowd of folk arrived under her window, and and gave her a concert on the vilest little Rebecca's fiddles and viols, um, and he said it was it was as bad as any music could have been in that country. John Knox, however, said that she liked it right well, so um, you can take what you want to of that. So that just maybe gives you a wee bit of a. Um, a sense of the age of the tradition. Um, the music itself, with what we know as our traditional repertoire for dancing, um, things like reels, hornpipes, and jigs, and strathspeys, um, are played in lots of different countries. Not so much as strathspeys, but reels, jigs, hornpipes are, are common to many countries, notably Ireland, but also England as well. Um, but the earliest accounts of um, these types of dance tunes are found in Scotland, and it's how, how likely they evolved there first before other places. And um, I'm, I'm used to the words uh, John Purser, who was a very, who was a very eminent musicologist, and that that's information was found in his book, The Music of Scotland. And um, we can go back to the what's the date? Um, 1590. James the sixth attended a famous witch trial in Be North Berwick, and um, Agnes Thompson was up. Um, for witchcraft along with others. And one of the claims was that they took hands on the land and danced the reel or short dance. And that was in 1590. And that is the earliest reference to the reel as a, as a, as a dance. The jig and the hornpipe are very, very old as well. Um, the oldest jig commit to paper was in 1615, and that was a tune called Hunts Up. And then there's a the mocking jig, Hey Tutti Tati, which is said to have been, and there's good reason to believe that it was sung during and before the Battle of Bannockburn. So that's 1314. So our dance music's got a very, very old vintage. Um, but one of the, the more recent tunes I'm going to come to, I'm going to start about 1700 with a tune called McPherson's Rant. And I could tell you blood curdling stories about James McPherson. He was, a, he was a legend in his own lifetime and beyond, partly because Robert Burns collected his, his um, tune and the folk song and um, adapted it, uh, improved it, if you like, I'm sure he would say, and it, um, it's enjoyed popularity ever since. But this tune was apparently um, written by James McPherson the night before his execution, um, the 16th of November, 1700. So I'm going to play that and um, you'll probably, a lot of you will know this tune. Thank you. 
go on with that. It's a lovely tune, but it, it, it kind of shows you the, some of the older folk music has a lot of drones in it. And um, Mayor, recent, recently you were attended to find that still existed in Shetland up until in the early 20th century. It was still very common. And that, that may well be kind of links to Scandinavian music, actually. If you hear the Hardanger fiddle in Norway, you can hear the, the echoes of that, of that in, in some Shetland music. But certainly it was... Yeah, you can hear Appalachian music. Folk are using the fiddle. They frequently use double stopping and chords to help fill out a song melody. So anyway, that's a great old tune. Um, yeah, we may say on a mayor about James McPherson, but um, he was a real person. He was hung in bump. He operated. He was he was paid, paid neck and operated mainly through a uh, bump shop, actually. So after that, we've got the... It's it's really the period for the Strathspey really evolved into something distinctive. And originally they were known as Strathspey reels. And I think it's really because they begin to, to, to pick up this accented dotted rhythm, we call it. If you can read music, you find that Strathspeys have dotted quavers followed by semi-quavers or semi, semi-quavers followed by dotted quavers. And um, that's the kind of common rhythm that you find. And um, they were called Strathspey reels. So I think in that part of the country, they really began to pick up something that became very distinctive in its own right. But you can pretty much play any reel like a Strathspey and vice versa. And if I use an example, um, a James Scott Skinner tune called the Laird Drum Blair, um, I'll let you hear it as a Strathspey. <laughs> He also gives it the title Angus Campbell. Now, I'm not sure if this is accidental or he's been a wee bit cheeky, but um, it's exactly the same tune as a real. So you can pretty much do, do that way on a on a strathspey and on a reel. You can make them sound like either. Um, but um, going back to strathspey, but I think it kind of developed. Hence the reason it's stuck. The title is stuck. The strathspey. Um, one of the earliest, um, what I would describe as a stylist of the strathspey, was a man called Angus Cumming, and he was a man who came. Um, for a family that all his forebears had been professional musicians. And one of his ancestors um, is one of the earliest paintings of a piper. And he was um, he was a Cummings who was piper to Grant of Castle Grant. And you can see that painting to this day. It's on the cover of books. He's very elaborately dressed um, as befitting a clan chieftain's retinue. So, um, so that's the same family. And um, although he never put his name to a single tune, there's quite a few tunes in his collection that was published in 1780 that are believed to, it's more than likely that some of that tunes would be his. And um, there's no doubt that he certainly is influential in the, the development of this spay, which leads on to folk like Neil Gow. The music, um, I think, the dot rhythms were probably around in folk singing and things like that. I've heard folks saying that the Strathspey, oh, it comes for Gaelic singing. Well, it's maybe a wee bit simplistic. I think there's lots of different influences feeding into that. But the Strathspey is definitely, a, it's the it's a jewel in the crown of Scottish music. It's it's the most unique dance music to come from Scotland. And um, it's only really found in Scotland or places where Scots have settled in large numbers. So in um the best example being Cape Breton for, for one place. And they're also played in Northern Ireland um, in Donegal, where they're known as Highlands. And that's a different story because that's the day we seasonal work. But if we go um, back to Strathspey. <laughs> we come to a tune called Tullach Gorham. The Tullach Gorham is, it's, in some ways, simplistic, but it's a masterpiece um, to my mind. And it was a great favourite of folk like Neil Gow and James Scott Skinner and Robert Burns as well, actually. And it's 
it's got a native fire about it that it could only come from Scotland. Finn, you hear it, it, it's it couldn't be Irish, it couldn't be English, it couldn't be Scandinavian, it could only be Scottish. And so I'm going to play that for you. Tullach Gorham sells a farm that's on the banks of the River Spey overlooking the Cairn Gorms. It's quite a beautiful place. The farm's still there to this day. And I've played this tune on the farm, on the spot, and um, it's quite a wonderful experience to do that. So this is Tullach Gorham. feel about it. That gives me goosebumps actually when I hear the <laughs> feel that it goes round your round the corkscrews around your spine when you hear that. Well certainly it is in my case. So for that period, early 1700s for the Straspe and that kind of fiddling is is um, thriving in Straspe, the focus moves to Persia, Highland Persia. And this is um an essence wrapped up in one man, Neil Gow. Now he wasn't the first fiddler for that bit of the world, I'm pretty sure. But he was the, the, the most notable, and there's no, there's no question he was a larger-than-life character. There's lots of stories. Some might be true, some are certainly nay. But uh, he was born in 1727, Neil Gow. He was the son of a plague weaver, and he was um, born near Dunkeld um, at Inver, which is where he died. He lived there his entire life. But during that period, he um, became the toast of the highest society. He played for some of the big balls in Edinburgh at the assembly rooms. He was a regular performer at um, Blair Castle amongst a, a lot of the aristocracy. And the reason that fiddling um, kind of enjoyed a renaissance, it's, it's, it's described as the golden age of Scottish fiddle music. This is after the Jacobite Rebellion. Now, Neil first comes to notoriety in 1745 when he wins a fiddle competition in Perth, which was open to the whole of Scotland. And there was a hundred fiddlers and the, the judge, who was a blind man called John McCraw, swore that he could have picked Neil's bow and out amongst the hundred fiddlers. And um, apparently um, Neil won it to the, to the, how did they put it? To the pleasant acceptance of all the competitors there. So and I think it was generally considered he was the best. Um, quite a character and wrote some of our finest tunes to this day. So I'm now going to play a set of Neil's tunes. Um, as it happens, on Neil's own fiddle, or one of his three fiddles that are known. There's one at Blair Castle, the most famous, which is the worst of the three of them, <laughs> is to be said. And I, I think it, it's maybe beyond the stretch of imagination to think that walking from Inver to, to Blair, you would, would you really want to carry your best fiddle there and back every time you go? I think you might leave a fiddle there. Not your best one. Oh, anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> this one is in the care of the, the Gaelic Society of Perth. And um, it came to a man called Duncan McCarricker, who was a, he claimed to be a pupil of Neil Gow, but certainly for that area, um, Dunkeld, it was called the Dunkeld, no, no, the Perthshire Paganini, I think he was known as. So he must have been a fair player. And it, um, it came into the hands of the Gaelic Society eventually. There is a plaque on the back um, a wee silver plaque, which is probably too difficult to see, but there you go. So this is one of his fiddles, and I'm going to play a set of his tunes now. Um, I'm going to start with The Stool of Repentance. It's one of Scotland's best-known jigs, followed by arguably his best-known tune, the um, Neil Gow's Lament for the Death of His Second Wife, and then two tunes called Miss Drummond of Perth, a Strathspey and a Reel. <laughs> <laughs> 
all very much in Neil's distinctive style. Thank <laughs> you. 
there you go. So that's Neil Gow. You could honestly, you could do a health program just on Neil. But since we're on the Gows, I'm going to move on to one of his sons, his fourth son. And now all his sons play the fiddle. Um, there was Neil Gow, Neil Jr., there was John. Nathaniel was his fourth son. And um, the most acclaimed um, for, for several reasons. He was an accomplished player. It said he was actually a better player than his father. Um, he, he was sent for lessons with um, Red Rob McIntosh. Robert McIntosh um, was Neil's biggest competition in the day. Um, he was called Red Rob for his fiery red hair and his fiery tem uh, temperament. And he was actually um, buried in London because he played at a lot of society events down there. Because he, he didn't just play Scottish music, he, he wrote minuets and stuff that was very classical as well. And I think it'd be a mistake to think that Scotland was a kind of backwater for the continental ideas didn't they, um, arrive. That, that would be definitely wrong to think that. I think um, during a lot of this, the Baroque period was going on, and there's actually quite a lot of similarities stylistically between um, traditional Scottish fiddle playing and Baroque music at the time. So um, that's another subject, however, so we'll leave that just now. But we'll play some Nathaniel tunes. He wrote some beautiful tunes, some very well-known tunes, and... Um, I'm going to play one or two um, for you. And as it happens, I've got Nathaniel's fiddle here. Now, out of all the fiddles I'm going to play tonight, this is the only one it's, I can verify is definitely Scottish. And this fiddle here was made in Everdeen in 1777 by Joseph Ruddiman, who was one of the best makers and, and repairers in Scotland at the time. Um, Neil had slipped crossing a dam Crossing that, well, it was, it was frozen, of course. He couldn't have quite walk in water. But uh, no, he, the frozen dam was a shortcut to him one night after playing, and he slipped. Now, fiddle players now that generally have hard cases that protect the instrument. At that time, it was the common thing to carry a fiddle in what was known as a green bass bag. And, of course, not a lot of protection, that light and easy to carry, but... Um, he landed and split the fiddle, and so he decided upon going to see Joseph Ruddiman. And um, so he, he, I'm not sure if he took a pony or he walked out of the way, but he certainly came to Aberdeen. Um, the fiddle was repaired by Ruddiman, but while he was there, this instrument was purchased for Nathaniel. And it's one of the best Scottish fiddles I've ever played. It's one of the nicest fiddles I've ever played, full stop, actually. And this is owned by Duncan Wood, who was a very who is a very fine player in his own right. He's an antiques deal dealer, but he was a friend, a, a friend of Ron Ganella, who was one of the best known and most celebrated fiddlers of the 20th century for Scotland. Ron owned this fiddle and he left it to, um, to Duncan, who's from Cullen, but he spends a lot of time in Edinburgh. So I'm going to play some tunes from Nathaniel. He was born in 1763. And he wrote great music, but his biggest let down with Nathaniel, he was guilty of plagiarism. And I, I would like to think it was accidental, but actually, I think it was so blatant. <laughs> uh, the music of William Marshall, especially, there was far too many cases for he took Marshall's music and renamed it and put his own um, name to the tune. And uh, that was one of the main reasons William Marshall's music ended up being published, because Nathaniel was claiming all the credit which is a little bit naughty, I think you'll agree. But anyway, these tunes I'm going to play are beautiful tunes, and it, it just seems a shame he let himself down there a little bit. So I'm going to play um, Miss Sally Hunter of Thurston, which is a, a jig, and then I'm going to play Miss Hamilton of Pent Caitland, and then um, we'll play the fairy dance to finish. And, and certainly the fairy dance should be in any fiddle player's repertoire. It's such a well-known piece. <laughs> Thank you. 
there you go. That's Nathaniel Gow. And um, great composer in his own right. Now, um, the reason I've got these fiddles, you, you might be wondering why, why have I got all these um, lovely historic instruments? Well, I did a, um, a recital at Celtic Connections last January, um, 28th of January, I think it was. And um, I was going to be playing at the Neil Gow Festival a couple of months later, and I decided to record all the fiddles while I had them. And um, they were going to be handed back at that point, but of course we got locked down, and I've had these fiddles ever since. <laughs> I've had them ever since, so it's, it's a great um, privilege to have them, and um, eh, I've recorded all of Neil Gow's music on his own fiddle, and they're on YouTube if you, if you want to look them up. I've recorded all of Nathaniel Gow's, eh, Gow's tunes on his own fiddle, so you can look them up. Um, the next player I'm going to speak about is William Marshall, and um, he was an amazing character, William. He was he was born in um, 1748 up in Murray, so um, he would have been one of the guy's biggest competitions if he'd been a professional, but he spent his entire working life working for the Dukes of Gordon, the fourth and fifth Dukes. He started at um, the age of 12. Um, as a, He was a door boy opening the door for the butler, because the the butler was far too high and mighty to open the door himself, so he had a wee boy to open the door. And um, but by the time he retired, he was he was a land agent for the Gordons, so he was basically like the estate manager for their extensive um, land holdings in the northeast of Scotland. So he was a, an important figure. He was a man who was just as comfortable with the common folk as he was with the aristocracy, and um, he followed the Gordons wherever they went. Um, he was a noted um, athlete, dancer. He um, was into mathematics, um, land um, and building surveying. Um, he had a great interest in the heavens. He taught himself clock making. And he is arguably our finest composer of Scottish fiddle music. So, um, yeah, he's quite a man, is um, William. So I'm going to write, sorry, I'm going to play one or two tunes of his. Robert Burns probably put it best. And he says he was the finest composer of Slithspays of the age. So that's high praise indeed. And um, I'm going to play one or two of his tunes. The first one is called Miss Hannah of Elgin, which is a jig. Then I'm going to go into um, Craigiel Hebrig, which um, I have interviewed quite a few fiddlers over the years. And they're actually, I think I interviewed about 25 that are on record at the Elphinstone Institute, actually, because um, I certainly left them all with them there. I'm sure you could hear them. But the, 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 the Strasbe came out highest as being Mess Fiddler's favourites was Craig Elke Brig as being the finest Scottish to Spain. So we'll play that and then go into Miss Jane McKinnis of Dandelith to finish. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that's William Marshall. Um, this is my own fiddle I'm playing, Nay Williams. His fiddle's actually, it, well, that's a good story. It was left to one of his pupils, a man called Charles Grant, who was a schoolmaster for Aber, Aberlauer, actually, and um, a noble player. And one thing about him is they said that um, he had fished every pool in the length of the spay, which is quite an achievement, I have to say. But um, he was probably one of his finest pupils, and when William lay dying on his deathbed. Um, Charles Grant came to play his favourite space for him at his bedside as he lay dying. And in gratitude to that, the family gave Charles his fiddle, which is a lovely touching thing to do. I mean, it's his singing voice, so you couldn't really give someone much more personal than, than that. And the fiddle is now in Edinburgh University's Musical Instrument Archive at St Cecilia Hall. And so they didn't let it do it, but I did the, but I did the recital. They sent two people with it. And when we finished, they took it wash straight back to the university that night. So and they were good enough to let me play it. So if I ever use it again, I'll, I'll have two um, bodyguards for the fiddle, which is the first time I've seen that, but it's probably appropriate. So anyway, that's William Marshall. Now we're getting, we're getting through them now. Um, there's so many names I can't really mention, but one or two I will um, drop in. You can maybe investigate at your leisure. Um, Pete Burney, an early player. Um, Angus Cumming, I've said. Um, Isaac Cooper, um, great composer. William Christie, who came from Cummiston near Turriff. Um, Robert McIntosh, I've mentioned. Red Rob. Um, Joseph Lowe, John Creerer, he was a pupil of Neil Gow. Um, and then in the 20th century, Hector McAndrew would be top of my list. Bill Hardy, um, Bert Murray, Tom Anderson, Angus Grant, who's still alive for Fort William. Hey, Willie Hunter for Shetland and Ron Ganella. And would be names that are all worth investigating. Angus Cameron being an, another. Um, all great players, all very different, but that's your homework. Go, go and look look into them. Um, if, after William Marshall died in 1833, that really was the end of what's known as the Golden Age. And, and fashions had changed quite a bit. Can the types of dances that were popular were changing? They all spades and reels. To a fair degree, had gone out of fashion amongst high society, the aristocracy, the land of gentry. And they were looking for, for more continental things, which led to the, the golden age fizzling out a wee bit. But it, it kind of was rejuvenated in great style by a man called James Scott Skinner, who I probably didn't need to say too much about. He was, he was born in Barclay in 1843, and he was taught by a man called Peter Milne, who was known as the Tarlin Minstrel, who I am related to. <laughs> Peter, um, he was born in Kincardine and Neil, actually, but he was brought up in Thailand. He was an itinerant musician, and um, he travelled the country playing um, to great success, actually. One of the things he did was he was invited to play at Balmoral Castle by Queen Victoria, and he, he was he was given a gold medal for that performance. And um, <laughs> he, he, one of the tunes he played was an air cut, Al Robin Gray. And I think Queen Victoria noted that he'd, he'd played it most pathetically, which you could tap too wise. <laughs> and it, it wasn't very good, or it was just caught the emotion of what is a very moving bit of music. So I think there's no doubt that it was fit happened, but it's just the, the, the style of writing of that period um, sometimes just to carry on to the, into the 21st century quite as well as I would like. But anyway, um, he was fiddler to the Marks of Huntley. He led orchestras in Aberdeen, Leith, Edinburgh, and Manchester. But his life um, was dogged by misfortune. Uh, difficult to mark a, a living as a musician at the best of times, but certainly in the Victorian era, very difficult. And um, he, he would have been quite a heavy drinker. Um, he, he started taking opium for his uh, rheumatism. Um, while in Manchester, and, and somebody suggested that opium was just a thing, and he used to chew it in lumps, like candy, I suppose, and he would chew it up. And um, Scott Skinner, in his um, biography, said that um, he used to get quite nippy without his opium, 
and for he got it, he was in a much better mood. So, that, so there you go. But this obviously leads into a downward spiral. And poor old Peter was in a pub in Everdeen. Um, well, it must have been 1898. And one of his cronies thought it'd be highly amusing to pull the chair from behind him as he went to sit down. And Peter went to sit down, obviously missed the seat. And he hurt himself so badly in that tumble that um, he was bedridden for the last 10 years of his life. And he was, he was taken to what was basically the poor house. And um, that is where he died in 1908. And he was buried in a pauper's grave. Um, that's probably one of the best things I ever did at the Elphinstone Institute was trap doing Peter's grave. Because I have to say, I, it, I felt very unsatisfactory that when I did concerts and I always played Peter's music, I could never say he's buried here. It was like he's buried somewhere in Everdeen. And well, I took, I'll be honest, several months trying to figure out where he was. And eventually I got a very pleasant woman on the end of the phone. Um, I didn't even ken that there was such a thing as the, it was the bereavement and cemeteries department at the council. That was news to me. She said, yes, they've got all the information, but this could take me quite a long time. She was very deadpan and she's, she says, this could take me ages. And uh, she phoned back and they would found him and he was buried in the Nelfield Cemetery. Great Western Road, right across to the, the Ashfield Chip Supper. And so we raised money to concert in Tarland. And we got permission. The local granite merchant guy, um, Gregor Robertson, picks up heat stains. He knew just the man to speak to. We got the permission. And we had a fair old set, set, uh, ceremony at his grave. There was 12 folk in that grave. He was second last in. There was five infants in the same grave. And uh, we've we got a lovely stone put up, simple but respectful. And um, the Lord Lieutenant Everdeenshire unveiled it that day. So um, nice way to finish Peter's story. But he was Skinner's tutor, and I'd be place Skinner's music to finish up. But this is a, a few tunes by Peter on his own fiddle once again. This is a German-made factory fiddle. And by that, I don't mean it was made in a big factory. There was, it was like a cottage industry. It is the instrument or... A, a poor man. I didn't think for a minute this was the fiddle he played at his best, but I think this is the fiddle he had at the end of his life. And this landed in the hands of John Murdoch Henderson, who was a great authority on Scottish fiddle music. And I picked it up at the antique shop and did it a few years ago. And it felt like the fiddle had eventually found its way back, its way back to Turland, which amuses me no end. So I'm going to play... Um, James O. Forbes, of course, which is a slow recipe. And then we're going to go into John McNeil, which is Peter's best known tune. You hear this all over the world. <laughs> So there you go. I mean, it's 
it's actually got a very nice mellow tone. Very different. I, I don't care how well this is coming across to you, but every instrument is very diff different. And therefore, they're actually quite difficult to play one after another because you've constantly got to adjust. Um, but there you go. Um, it's as close as I can get you to the real players is playing their fiddles. And um, that brings us back to James Scott Skinner, who I'm probably going to just round up with. Um, he, he really was a legend in his own lifetime. As I said, born in 1843 in Bankery. Um, a modest family, but a musical family. His father died when he was 18 months old. Uh, brought up by his mother. His brother Sandy was um, kind of there, giving his first fiddle lessons. And then he kind of got an apprenticeship with Peter Milne. Five shillings a month, regardless of the amount of um, concerts that you had to play or dances. And he played at dances hour, D side and stripped on where they had to walk to them. He uh, he accompanied them by vamping on the cello. Um, eventually he, uh, and he looked at Peter as like a father figure and they remained good friends all their life. Um, he joined a juvenile orchestra with Dr. Mark's Little Men. And it, during that time, he got his um, fairly accomplished classical training. He was taught by a man called Charles Rougier, who was the lead fiddle player of the Halley Orchestra, very successful orchestra of the day. Um, and he'd been through the Paris Conservatoire. So Skinner got eyes classical um, technique for Charles Rougier. And in his career, he, he, he would do concerts and he would play classical music and then he would play strespays and reels and things like that. And um, early on, he was a dancing master as well as a fiddler. And he happened to start classes in Balata when Queen Victoria had um, asked for a demonstration of dancing by the children of the estate, to which the reply was they couldn't dance. And she was most put out and she um, asked, couldn't a dancing master be found? And Skinner had been advertising in Balter and so oh, there's a young Mr. Skinner. And so he got this book in to teach the tenants at Balmoral to dance. And um, it was it, probably the best boost his career he could possibly have got. And um, someone he certainly would have um, made the most of, there's no question about that. It was a great self-promoter. He composed well over 600 pieces. He, um, he toured all over the UK, actually, Ireland as well. Um, he travelled to North America, and there's good reason to believe that he might well have been the first violinist to be recorded, because two years after the technology was invented in America, they have records of a Mr. Skinner from Scotland recording. The recordings aren't there, but that, that's as early as you could probably get for a violinist, I would like to think. Certainly the first Scotsman to do so. Um, very successful, but never very good with money. He was bankrupt several times. His life would mark a great movie. Um, that's another fact about old Skinner. Yes, when he died, they reckon there was 40,000 folk lined the streets of Aberdeen as his coffin passed by. And his gravestone is well worth going to see. It's quite a thing. I would like something similar one day. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. It's got the music to the Bonnie Lassa Bon Accord. It's got the um, bronze bust, the ma maquette of which is in the Bunkery Museum. And um, he wrote some great stuff, technically difficult somewhat. So I'm going to give you a wee flavour of both. I'm going to start with a slow air card, Back to the Hills, to give you a taste of his um, more demanding passages. And then I'm going to play the layer, the drum player, and maybe the left-handed fiddler or the hurricane finish. And then we'll take questions, I think. I've overrun already. I'm, I'm kind of watching Ian nervously to see if he's getting fidgety, but he seems to be okay. <laughs>
So, I don't know if you've got um, time for any questions, but I'll certainly answer only that I can. There's, I, I would like to just reinforce that there's a huge amount I, I never even got touched on. And um, this is largely to my heed. So, the commute might be totally different another time. So, um, so there you go. Um, I hope that was okay for you. Yeah. Can I ask everyone um, to find the unmute button and we can then give Paul a really warm round of applause? What is great? Yeah, and now I'm going to mute everybody again, and I'm going to mention something which um, which you may not be uh, aware of, but um, some of you I'm sure are very aware of it, and that is that professional self-employed musicians and other people in the arts, of course, have had a real struggle this last year. And so I put something in the chat, uh, have a look at it, copy and paste it uh, and maybe follow it up. That would be great. And you could then demonstrate in a really meaningful way how much you appreciated tonight and Paul's wonderful contribution. We have had a treat far beyond anything we could imagine. It was absolutely splendid. Uh, Zoom couldn't quite cope with it all, that's to be said. But it was still marvellous. It was still absolutely fantastic. So if everyone could be um, muted and stay muted. And if we get a hand up for a question, um, I will ask you if you would like to put the question. While you're thinking of a question, I'll put a question to Paul. Um, uh, you don't have to spend all night over the answer, Paul. But in other countries... Um, oral tradition seems to be the thing. Um, does that matter in Scotland? It all seems to be written down. What? How does uh, oral tradition work in Scotland? Well, it, it, it does, and for a long time that was it was available to most fiddlers. Um, I think there was a, there, there's even a degree of putting value on learning and getting lessons. I mean, if I take a Neil Go as an example, he put his own son. To get lessons for these folk, um, Robert McIntosh and Alexander King McGlashan. So there's been a degree of that that uh, quite a lot of players could actually play, but they didn't actually own a lot of collections. They wrote down in little books. They had their own books with their own repertoire written in in their own hands. And you, you sometimes come across them. They're real treats because you, you'll find quirky um, 
variants of tunes that are quite different from the notated version you'll find in kind of accepted collections. And I think that's the, the one thing about collections that they're great for preserving the music, but they tend to standardise things and you get the, the, the local regional variants. And, and sometimes that can vary vary from glen to glen and village to village. I mean, you can hear that in accents. You just have to go up the coast and you maybe find that folk in Gordon speak a bit different from folk in Inverbervie. I mean, that traditionally would have been quite common. And um, so I think the fiddle, the fiddle playing is the same. I think um, there was a lot of that. Eventually, as time goes on, for you get folk getting lessons much more, I think that would probably be something you would find more in the 20th century, I, I would suggest. Um, collections were quite expensive. And it's folk that had money that had the, the early collections. Now, I would say things like the Apple collection, Marshall's collections, even at, at Scott Skinner's times, his books, there was folk who subscribed. And it, it was our lord and lady, that's the duke and that's the, the marquis of that. Um, so it's, they were expensive to buy. And so I, I think at a, ground, a grassroots level, folk um, pass things on by ear. And I think that's I've been the case. Now, I learned at school. Um, I might have started on the fiddle found under the bed, but um, at my granny and grandis, which is where I'm sitting at this minute, but um, I learned at primary school then, started going to the Barclays Suspe and Real, and it was I, it was art with music, and I think we're a big group. You, you kind of want folk to be more or less playing roughly the same thing, because if you're going to play in it, it's not great if everybody's got different versions. Of course, this leads to standardisation of how you play. But that said, I've, I've I personally picked up a lot of stuff by ear, and a lot of players still do. So it still exists, but um, for, for you, you sometimes find it's, it's, it's players that come from a classical background that um, find it very hard to extract themselves from the written page. I mean, I teach with music myself, but once they've got that tune in their head, get rid of the music, get rid of it, and I really look, would look for a player to um, hey, the elements of the tradition, but speak with their own voice. So I'm not sure if that's entirely sticking to your point, um, Ian, but um, I would imagine there's some traditions it's much more orally transmitted. That would be true. In Scotland, I think it was exactly the same at a time. And there's various reasons why that might have happened. Um, I, it's, that's a really complicated subject, but Oral traditions still exist. I, I still teach by ear sometimes. I'll do workshops by ear because there's a lot to be said for that. Folk really listen to what you're saying and what you're playing. It's very easy to get sucked onto the page and, and go down a rabbit hole when you're just focused on the notes, but never really listening to what's going on around about you. So um, it, it's quite useful to play by ear. It's a different skill, actually. Um, my cousin Gary plays accordion and he cannot play the simplest tune without the music in front of him. And you tuck that music away, it could be blah, blah, black sheep, and he, I think he might well struggle. He's a fantastic player. He's been a Scottish champion in his seniors. Um, so it's meant to be a lack of ability, but he's so grounded in playing with music, he'll never tuck it away. I mean, I personally think you play better without music. You, you stop looking at what to play and think how to play it. So far possible, I always play without music if I can. But um, again, that, I'm, that, I'm drifting away from your point. Did that come close to answering it, Ian? That, that was an absolutely excellent answer, Paul. And uh, you brought out all the points that I thought, well, I hoped you might bring out. And certainly listening to John McNeil, uh, Peter Milne's tune, played by you, and then thinking about the way the Métis people in Canada and the Cree people in Canada and the people of Labrador and Newfoundland, they all play that tune, but they all play it differently, don't they? Uh, yeah, it absolutely. I mean, uh... Have I thought, or well, once I was a bit older and a bit more experienced, that when you you listen to the various regional styles, you look at Scotland. It's 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 not a big country, but there's lots of regional styles, very much in the sense that we've got regional dialects when we speak, and that, and ultimately, I think that's why you get regional differences in style because mm. folk have a different accent for whatever they play, and I think it comes out in their playing. So. To me, that's one of the great things about traditional music, that you can do that. Um, I would hate to think it becomes a homogenised um, 
folk music, Celtic music. For we've got a bit of Irish and a bit of Scottish and a bit of English and a bit of bluegrass and a bit of Scandinavian. Um, that's near criticism of these different styles, but I think it's it's good to hear that unique elements being there. I mean, play it if you like, of course, but I, I think it's um, it's one of the best things about the northeast tradition is that it sounds like it's been the northeast. It couldn't be anywhere else, just like Shetland or West Highland, or if you tax to the space, you go to Donegal. I mean, I could I could demonstrate actually quite well, but have you got time here? Three little demonstrations. Uh, we, we've, I think we've time. I've time. Go on. Right. Go Very for it. Very quick. Uh, William Marshall tuned the Duke of Gordon's birthday in the kind of, let's call it the Northeast style. Or the Scottish style, at least. <laughs> So you get the idea. If you go to Cape Breton, would be a good example. Quite different thing. The accents are much, uh, they've got greater attack, I think you'll find. A bit like how I speak, actually, if I think about it. Um, if you go to Donegal, you can hear a very clear Irish accent coming out. Yes, absolutely crystal clear, Paul. Uh, you made the point magnificently with those examples. And uh, um, I'm changing the subject now. I've picked up a message in the chat here um, from Anne Carmichael. My grandparents lived in Drumblair House where Skinner had reputedly been butler. Hmm. I wonder if Anne's got any other memories of Scott Skinner. Well, yeah. I have got some information on, on that. Um, Skinner actually had a gardener's cottage rent free at Drum Blair. So he wasn't the butler. But um, the laird of the house actually was, he, his name was M McCarthy, and he made his money in the iron industry, a bit like Carnegie in a, in a sense. And um, he was a great admirer of Skinner, and Skinner frequently being very hard up, um, was delighted to accept um, um, a rent free cottage. And he wrote, the Laird of Drum Blair in the Gardner's Cottage, and um, he woke up one night with the tune Berlin Rooney's Heed. And I can definitely concur that if you have something in your head, you've got to get it written down. Then I go, go to sleep thinking it'll be there in the morning because it absolutely will have disappeared in the ether. So he wrote it on the only piece of paper he could find, which was the wrapper to a bar of soap. And that is what he presented to the Laird of Drum Blair. <laughs> Who was apparently highly delighted. <laughs> I was the best rapper he could have wished for. Um, now, uh, I don't see anyone with questions. I'm going to gallery view. Um, you can do it in reactions or you can just uh, wave your hand or something or unmute yourself and say, I've got a question. So have we got another question coming in? You're all dumbstruck. I can see that. I, I, I think they've heard enough. <laughs> no, no, I Is think... It, I, he's never going to stop. <laughs> don't be ridiculous, Paul. I think that's uh, uh, not true at all. There must be some other questions. There's lots of people saying how much they've enjoyed it and how, how great it's been. No question about that. Um, I'm looking. I still can't see anybody so, waving a hand. Hello. Hello. Who's hello. that? Bill. Hello. Bill. Fire yeah, away. so um, so is this was that the first rapper? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it was a rapper, yeah, it definitely it was a rapper, but um, maybe in the sense folk would understand it nowadays. 
<laughs> for like, actually, that's a funny. Sub, that's an interesting subject. Now, I, I fully expect that there's very few fans of hip hop and rock music are watching this the night. But actually, I saw an article, and it went into great length about how the Scotch snap that is very common in Scottish music, especially Swiss space. It's that um, day, day, da, da, dum, day, da, da, dum, that da, dum, the snap that is kind of very characteristic of Scottish music has become a key part of folk when they are rapping. And they it's acknowledged by folk and know about this sort of stuff that it's it's basically Scotch snap. And it seems the most unlikely place for a bit of Scottish um, traditional music to turn up because you, you kind of hear it melodically, but r- rhythmically it's absolutely there. So um, I would never have thought to bring that up unless you'd mentioned rapping. So thanks, Bill. <laughs> Good for you, Paul. Uh, you, you used to. Um, I remember how you used to talk about the the driven up bow when you're talking about northeast style. I well, the, the, the way they used to put it when I was um, when I was a loon, when I was learning the fiddle, and um, some of the old boys did a great way of speaking about things, and they they would say things like, "You play it with a bit of gar," and it was quite, It seemed quite aggressive when they said it. So it's just Kind of they would lean in and and gur, <laughs> so play it with gur, and I I just thought it was kind of vocalised character really, but actually it's a proper Scots word that it, it means to play uh, what means with with force and drive, and I that is exactly exactly what you're looking for. So it's an old Scots word that it kind of lingered. I'd never heard it anywhere else until I met some old fiddlers and, and they they described the, the music needing that. Uh, Scott's going to put it a different way, says so you put to play your space with the devil in them. And so it's a, basically another way of saying the same thing. Um, David, um, I notice you're, you've unmuted yourself. Do you want to ask a question? Yes. Um, I was watching you, you tuning, and you, you when you, in between numbers, you were tuning not where where people normally tune, which is from the bottom end of the fiddle. Uh-huh. You did it much closer to you. You, well, you tune. I'll, Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what, what that is. I mean, that, that's something that you find very commonly nowadays. If you, if you, you watch classical musicians, uh, very few of them have what are known as adjusters. And if I, I hope, hopefully you can see this up at the end. You see them? Now, the, <laughs> They, they are for fine tuning the fiddle, um, because you find, a lot of folk find it quite difficult to get. I mean, you you find with a peg, unless they're working absolutely beautifully, they can be a bit sticky, and it's easy to go past the pitch, and then you go back and you miss it again. And trying to get them on the right pitch can be quite arduous for a lot of folks. So I, I um, like a lot of fiddlers use adjusters. Now, most classical players would, they'll have one adjuster on the E string, which is the high one. But they'll have the other, the other ones will not have. And the reason for that, it's supposedly it gives the string greater length. Well, you're, well, you're only really talking about that much, but it says it allows for greater tone. Um, personally, I've never found an issue with getting tone. I mean, I, I think Ian was expressing some concern about the, the uh, Zoom was struggling with, with the the amount of volume I was putting out. I'm quite a loud float player, so it's never been a problem for me. But that's what it's for fine tuning. So all fiddles have pegs at the top, obviously. Um, it's it's kind of force a habit with myself that I kind of help myself. Between every set, I check my tuning just to, to make sure because it's very off-putting to, to discover when you go into a new set that you're out of tune. Even by a little bit, it really annoys me. So I, I will, I'll ficker about in tune between. The, the other issue with these other fiddles, that, that apart from my own one, the other ones are not played nearly as much and they um, go out of tune quite a lot. And so there's quite a lot of tweaking to try and keep them in tune. So that, that's the problem when you play lots of instruments, you've got lots of instruments to tune. <laughs> so again, that was maybe a, a little bit long-winded, but... They're fine tuners, they're called adjusters. And for mm-hmm. you, you, you're talking about small increments. These things are ideal, but you'll very rarely see a classical musician using one. No, okay, thank you. Thank okay. you, David, yes. for the question. Have we got another question coming? Uh, please feel free to unmute. 
Jim. Hello. Yes, hello, Paul. Oh, come in, come in, Fitter Kim. <laughs> you mentioned that Neil Gow took part in competitions, and I know that Scott Skinner did too. Has the competition got a part in the fiddling world? I know that the Glenfiddich competition was discontinued. You started a competition at the Boyne. We have plenty of piping competitions. Is there a place for more competitions in, in fiddling? I, I mean, Glen, Glenfiddich um, stopped a few years ago. And that, it, for, for the entire period that it ran, it, it was the premier championship for Scottish fiddle music. Um, I've often heard folks, uh, some folk are of the, the view that music and competitions should not go together. It goes a, against the whole ethos of music. Um, it's got a very long tradition in Scotland and that, that competition with Neil Gow is a good example. Folk were doing it way back in 1745. There's every reason to think they were happening before that. There's examples of piping competitions going back way before then as well. And um, I mean, it is just one person's opinion when you're judging, unless there's three of you, of course. But um, a different judge can come up with a completely different result. But the one thing I would say about competition is it makes you focus on the elements of the music that you would expect to find to mark it distinctly Scottish. So the character, the bowing techniques, things like Ian mentioned, the up-driven bow, which um, is uniquely Scottish. Now, if I'm judging a competition, just as I was judging myself in my own day, it's the sort of thing only decent player who's judging will be looking for because these are the distinct things that give you your music character and I think that that's the one thing I mean in classical music they go through grades and that's another thing that gives you a sense of progression a sense of achievement that you've, you've got up a step I've got great I've got grade two distinction grade three oh it was only merit but it's still okay <laughs> and it gives you a sense of that you're getting on and I think competitions can be like that as well and I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, I I find that it's it's a community in itself. There's folk they turn up to other competitions. They become they find a community of friends. I mean, there's folk that I'm still friendly now with that I met when I was ten and eleven. Um, you obviously meet them in other places at festivals and concerts over the years. But um, uh, there, there are lots of competitions. There are mothballed at the minute, of course. Um, but Glenfriddich stopped, but most of the festivals have competitions like Elgin, uh, Achter Oh, it doesn't exist anymore at the festival. It's doing uh, Falkland, um, what else? Kerry Muir, um, Keith Folk Festival. Um, there's competitions at TS, TMS in Aberdeen, Bankery Fiddle Festival, Angus. Um, there's Elgin. There's the Highlands and Islands um, Music and Dance Festival. They've got what's known as the Open Masters. Um, there's lots of competitions. They hate competitions up in Shetland. Um, so, so they definitely go on and um, they tend to go through phases for some years. You see the numbers dwindling and some years you think, oh, there's one or two players are up there, but they're kind of, maybe the standards nice so good that year, but it begins to come around again. I've seen, I saw it in my own time um, start fate, struggling a bit to get very popular and then fading off again and it goes around again. So it goes in cycles. Um, you'll find that our players, they just, they drop off the end, they just stop competing. I mean, I was 27 when I stopped competing. And that wasn't because I didn't want to compete. I just didn't have the time. You need to really focus on your repertoire very, um, uh, you need to get a lot of your time to practice. And, and it's, um, I couldn't really give that personally. You can, I was working full time at the firm at the time. Plus, um, I had a lot of uh, paying gigs. You can, I was, I was playing all over the country and, Spending all my time practicing on three sets, for instance, it's a lot of time to give to that that I couldn't really justify. So, um, I again, probably quite long winded and drifting off the point, but there's definitely a future for competitions. I mean, Glenfiddich stopped, but pretty much all the rest that have been going for many years are still going. And of course, we started there buying Highland Games one, which is very, very good. The, chart, the Chieftain's Fiddler, and um, some of the best prize money you could get in the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Ah, uh, cheers, Jim. Cheers. Nice to see you. Thank you, Jim, for your question. Um and thank you, Paul, for that uh, fascinating answer. I'm sure a, a, a number of us 
are familiar or have come across fiddle competitions or or piping competitions um, do we have a last question or shall we wind things up uh, well uh, if you could just unmute yourself if you do have a final question and jump straight in and I think um, yeah there might be somebody I don't know anyway um, can I just draw your attention back to the chat if you haven't found the chat uh, there's a symbol at the bottom that says chat with a little speech bubble above it if you click on that you can see the chat and you can also see there that um, I've mentioned how you might like to consider supporting Paul and his work through this very difficult period for self-employed musicians and artists and we're going to leave uh, the line open for a little while um, so you can hello and <laughs> say hi and make comments for a few minutes and um, uh, but before we go can I encourage as many of you as possible to unmute and give Paul a final round of applause from Aberdeen and District Soul Tire Society and everyone else it has been absolutely brilliant Paul thank you Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. It's my pleasure. Cheers, Charles. Thank you very much. Cheers, Paul. Uh, we're hoping to have a meeting, by the way, in May on a Thursday night, and um, I will send out details when we get confirmation of what that is. I'm trying to line up um, a writer. Okay, that will be really good. Good. Brilliant. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Goodbye. Good Thank night. you. Goodbye. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Fantastic. Safe in to Tartland. Right, that's it, isn't it? Uh, well, Carl. <laughs> it's, it's two of us left, is it? <laughs> you, you're going to have to get a new camera. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 uh, I've, I've made it for today. I'm going to send my computer now to James. Yeah, goes down to London now and let him deal with it. Oh, he'll put it in quarantine for you, I'm sure. I will, It'll yes. come back rejuvenated. Yeah. So I will be out of action for a little while. I only will be receivable over my mobile phone, I suppose, which will Yeah, yeah. Reasonably that'll work. Same. Yeah. That'll be, that'll be grand. Mm -hmm. No, it was fantastic again. So it was a good idea, yes. Because I, I like Paul yeah. Anderson, you see. Yeah. He's still listening to you there, Carl. He's is soaking he? it all up. Oh, is he? Yeah, well, I do. I'm I still do, here. Yeah. I'm st because I, yeah, I made, I'm still here, I made Carl. Call that, was it four or five years ago, whatever it was? At one of the uh, uh, events that was actually uh, sorry to mention it uh, that was before you got, got ill quite some time ago okay yeah all right well i'm not, not i'm not in, i'm not going into detail obviously. okay well a final cheerio to everyone and um and enjoy the rest of the evening and uh and especially you paul and a big thank you to shona as well for, i'm sure she's there somewhere even if it's only making your supper Okay. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Cheerio. 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 Cheerio.